first of all, believe and understand this is real right. and this is happening to kids. And then second, you know, be willing to understand that this may be why something is happening. Yeah. So I need to change the way I'm thinking about what I'm seeing. Whether it's sensitivity to sunlight, a preference for certain types of clothing, or a need to constantly rock backwards in a chair, the way our body interprets, avoids, or seeks sensory input influences our daily lives. How does the way neurodivergent brains interpret the sensations of the world impact their emotions and reactions? And what are the sensory systems beyond the five that we were taught about in elementary school? Today, we're talking with Dr. Robert Jason Grant, founder of Ought Play Therapy and author of Understanding Sensory Differences, a neurodiversity affirming guidebook for children and teens. That's straight ahead on episode 138. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and this is the Neurodiversity Podcast. What is neurodiversity? You see the world differently. Autism spectrum. Gifted. Complexities that are inherently inside. ADHD. Dysgraphia. Tourette's. All brains are different. You are exactly what this world needs. This is the Neurodiversity Podcast. I hope everyone is getting settled into the new school year. I'm preparing for a busy fall of travel and speaking at several different school districts and state conferences. If you're looking for professional development for your school district, I'd love to come work with you. You can find out more about booking in-person professional development at neurodiversitypodcast.com, or you can look into options for virtual continuing education on supporting twice exceptional students for yourself or your district at www.neurodiversity.university. My conversation with Dr. Robert Jason Grant is coming up next. On a previous episode of the Neurodiversity Podcast. Even before you seek that professional advice or consultation, evaluation, etc., you could start by having a conversation with your kid and have that conversation in a calm way. You know, if, if you seem stressed and scared or panicked or angry or upset, then you're going to convey that to your kid as well. You could just start by asking some questions like, how are you doing? What is on your mind? Share a little bit of your experience and model to your family that it's okay to go through difficult emotional experiences. And we all do sometimes. You know, sometimes we're so determined to show our kids that we're there for them that without realizing it, we may also be giving the message it's bad to be rattled or it's not okay to be upset. That's episode 110. Find it in your favorite podcast app. You are listening to the New Diversity Podcast. Today, I'm excited to welcome Dr. Robert Jason Grant back to the podcast. He is a play therapist and the creator of Ought Play Therapy, which is a neurodiversity affirming framework for play therapy. So welcome back to the podcast. Thank you, Emily. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to be back. I want to actually start out our conversation by quoting you back to yourself. Yes. One of the things that you've written when you've written about neurodiversity affirming therapy is this this quote that is something that you can kind of keep in mind when you're talking to kids about how to have that neurodiversity affirming framework. And it is, I'm not going to work with you on changing who you are. I'm going to work with you on how to help you get what you want or need. Can you share a little bit about that framework? Yeah. I mean, I love that quote back to myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I loved it when I first thought of it because, you know, I was trying to capture a way to talk, especially to my neurodivergent clients about, obviously, if they're, if they're seeing me, there is a need or needs. So there's things that we're going to be working on. There's therapy goals, but to be able to address those and at the same time, stay affirming of them as individuals, as neurodivergent individuals, their identity, you know, and just being able to communicate to them, your identity is okay, you know, and this isn't about judging that and trying to make you someone that you're not. Uh, I don't want to do that. But I know that there are probably things that you're wanting to do or get or accomplish or needs you have 
And so what we are going to do is work together to try to figure out how to do that. I think that's really powerful. And I think it's a nice, concise way to, to share that. Because I think that's really the essence of what it means to be neurodiversity affirming. Affirming means you are who you are. You are not broken. You are authentic, you know, and it's okay to, to be that person. And if there's, there are things that there are accommodations or supports or things that you do want to work on to improve so that you can get what you want or need more easily, then that's what we want to collaborate on. Yeah. I mean, it kind of sums it up. Mm -hmm. And I wish that that was kind of just the general philosophy right? when (laughs) neurodivergent kids entered any kind of mental health therapy or play therapy or any therapy of any kind. Yeah. The other piece of that that's really nice, and it goes along the lines of just one of the other neurodiversity affirming principles in all play is it opens up the conversation to let the child know that they have a voice in this, Mm -hmm. you know, that what they think and how they feel uh, and what they want is important. That's a very important part of this process. Maybe the most important, it's not about, okay, you know, I'm kind of like this authority of something. And I always like to get that message in there too, right in the beginning. You know, you are a part of this and your thoughts, feelings, and experiences, your wants are key in this therapy time. There are, I think, a lot of adults in the world who are learning more about their own neurodivergence that perhaps went unrecognized as a child. And you're one of them. Mm -hmm. You recognize your own sensory sensitivities and how they impacted you both as a child and also now. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, I'll try to share a little bit. But yes, let's start with, you know, not really understanding or getting a diagnosis till I was an adult, uh, which does happen to a lot of people. And at that point, uh, you know, it was kind of a two prong process. One was just all the looking back I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm kind of like looking at my childhood now through a completely different lens. And then the second part is, okay, where do I go from here? Um, And that was a little bit easier because uh, it gave me information, knowledge, gave me empowerment, uh, gave me the ability to be like, okay, now I kind of know what's happening in my system. And I can learn more about that. And then I can navigate this whole life a lot better. It's difficult to, I think, review back on a childhood that feels in some way a little lost because that information wasn't there from the beginning. And then the attunement to that information wasn't there. Not just with it myself, but you know, the people around me who were caregivers. And, uh, so that's a bit of a process to go through for sure. And I think that's true of a lot of adults who get a diagnosis, you know, later in life. And I write about this in the Understanding Sensory Processes book. Um, my childhood first was pretty problematic from a sensory standpoint. There was just a lot of needs that weren't met. And that produced a lot of dysregulation, anxiety, a lot of avoiding, masking, retreating behaviors in my childhood. And even when I discovered my diagnosis, um, you know, I was a younger adult and I really didn't take sort of a, oh, I'm neurodivergent and let me go kind of like advocate stance. I didn't know what that word was then. I'm not even sure if it was like really anywhere on my radar. You know, I kept that pretty private for a long time. There were a few key people who I would disclose to here and there along the way, but it took me a while to feel comfortable talking about it uh, and being able to share personal experiences. Uh, but it certainly, I think, drew me to the that population when I first started doing therapy, child therapy. And I don't think I had neurodivergent language at that time. 
but I recognized another me, <laughs> you know, in my childhood. And I was really drawn to those kids, you know, and like just trying to help them and advocate for them. Just, you know, totally got their experiences. And so I really liked that work. And then, of course, I think which has happened for a lot of us over the past couple of decades, we really have gotten the language and it's gotten more clear what we're talking about and what the neurodiversity paradigm is. And that's been wonderful. Yeah, really empowering. Yes. It's interesting. All of these things that maybe we didn't realize about ourselves or our kids and we're coming to this process, and especially when we're talking about sensory stimuli, I think that's a concept that most of us are familiar with on some sort of level, even if you and I obviously were in this world <laughs> every day, all day. Yes. So we're, you know, hyper aware of it. But, you know, I know for me, I'm very sensory avoidant, especially when it comes to both auditory and olfactory stimuli. I'm, I, it's different smells, different sounds, especially just really are difficult to, to handle. Can you just briefly walk us through some of the different types of sensory sensitivities that a person might experience? And also just because it goes beyond just those five senses that we're used to thinking about, and a lot of people might not be aware of those. So everybody kind of gets this idea, because it's been around forever, that there's these five senses, right? Our sight, our smell, our taste, our hearing, our touch. And then when we're talking about sensory integration or processing areas, there's three more, proprioceptive, vestibular, and the interoceptive. So any of the eight could produce a sensory difference for a person. If we would classify somebody as neurotypical or not having any sensory needs or differences, it would just mean that all that like sort of processing integration just goes really naturally. So where they may not even notice it, mm -hmm. they just do stuff and it just gets done and there's no problems or issues. Uh, or strange feelings or anything, right? It's just very smooth. You know, if there is a sensory need, I use the term sensory difference um, because I do think there are strengths in there too. Mm -hmm. And so I think when we just use sensory challenges or sensory processing disorder, it sort of takes us away from looking at, but there are strengths too. Mm -hmm. And I that's one of the things I notice in my journey is I started to recognize the specific sensory strengths that I had. Mm. Uh, anyway, so any of those eight, somebody can just have a hard time with processing or taking in information or they're not getting enough to really satisfy their tactile experience or their visual experience or their movement, proprioceptive experience. Or they're in a situation where something is overwhelming. It's too much. Mm -hmm. uh, they're getting too much or in a way that's very upsetting to the sensory processing system. And that can cause all kinds of things. For me, I'll just kind of use myself very sensory, um, avoidant visually. So one of the problems in my childhood was going into rooms where there was certain lighting or the big one for me is sunlight. It still is today. Uh, if it's hitting a certain way, it's like I can't think about anything else. And eventually, it would just even give me a headache. And as a child, there were just a lot of those situations that happened where I couldn't focus, I couldn't get my attention, I felt very uncomfortable if I couldn't get away from it. And as a child, you can't get away from a lot of things. You get kind of forced into places you can't and are not allowed to get out of. And I didn't know what was happening. I mean, if I knew what was happening, maybe somebody could have said, hey, that light's a problem. Right. <laughs> Can we do something for him? Uh, but nobody knew that, including me. So uh, it didn't happen. But it can be in any of the areas. There can be sounds that are really painful or really distracting for someone. Like you mentioned, certain smells. Uh, certainly when we get into proprioceptive and vestibular. Can you, can you explain those two a little bit more for people who might not be familiar? Sure. Proprioceptive has to do with basically, I'll give a little, the little quick de definition, just the understanding and awareness of body parts in relation to each other. You know, how that feels, how that navigates, 
Uh, and also that extends out to, you know, where's my body in relation to somebody else's body? And so, for example, if we have a child who really struggles with proprioceptive input and integration, this might be a child who is constantly bumping into everybody who's in front of them and behind them in line. Not because they don't understand how to stand in a line. They understand the concept intellectually. And not because they're not trying. It's because that sense that there's somebody right there in front of me isn't there. And so they don't probably even realize they're bumping into them until they do bump into them. And in some cases, they may not even realize they bumped into them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then they're unfortunately probably getting in trouble for that when really it's this sensory need area that is occurring. The vestibular uh, sense is my other issue personally, and this has to do with your body in relation to space. I think of it as in relation to air <laughs> because there are just certain positions my body can get in that just really starts to dysregulate me. I, I just start to feel very stressed and anxious. And again, for me, it's often I can't focus or think about anything else. One for me is if my feet are dangling in air. So like a ski lift is a, a horrible thing for me. I, <laughs> I have to do the times I've done them. I've had to do so much prep work before I got on the ski lift. And even though my brain is like, it's totally fine to sit on the ski lift, the rest of my system is just... Going haywire, yeah. <laughs> it really is. And I think where all these things matter for our kids is understanding that it could be something in school. This, these things can happen everywhere. And if we don't know that that's what's going on, you know, this is what's happening. This is what's maybe the teacher or someone is seeing as a behavior issue. And then maybe they're even taking the stance of punishing or giving a consequence. We're basically like just punishing a child for having a sensory response, right? a sensory need. Yeah. And that's very sad to think about. We're punishing you because you're having a sensory need is just a horrible thing to think about happening to any child. You have some sensory avoidance with some of the vestibular pieces. For me, I tend to be sensory seeking. So although I'm not doing it now, typically, if anyone ever sees me on a Zoom, I'm usually in a swivel chair and I'm usually swiveling back and forth. Right. And actually, it's funny because I'm sure I've been doing this for years. And until the pandemic, when I had to watch myself on Zoom all the time, I never realized that I did it literally almost all the time. Yes. The only reason I'm not right now is because my, my feet are dangling. And so <laughs> oh, no. I can't reach the floor. Um, but anyway, um, just like you said, when you're in this certain settings, this is where kids learn that they have to mask. Yes. They have to hide things. They have to just kind of like get through it, even though it's really hard. Like I can't move around that way or I have to move around this way. And it's really dysregulating, but then they have to also hold that all together too. You know, it's interesting. There's an example that always pops into my mind. It's not a huge deal in the quality of my life, but it, it always makes me think of this. If ever, ever I have to, or I've ever had to climb a ladder I have to look down. I have to look down at the ground the whole time. I can't look up. If I look up, it's like overwhelming. I feel like I'm going to just fall, jump off the ladder is what my body is telling me to do. Because I was, you know, kind of panicky if I had to climb a ladder and people would say, look up, look up, don't look down. And then the more I would follow that instruction, the worse it would get. Until I realized I need to look down. I need a, some sort of sense of grounding. Mm -hmm. I can even feel it now as I'm talking about it. Yeah, isn't that interesting? But you know, there's these things like that where let's take that same example and apply it to anything that, you know, somebody who doesn't have sensory issues, probably nine out of 10 or maybe 10 out of 10 of them do so much better if they look up if they're climbing a ladder and not looking down. Mm -hmm. And part of being, you know, sensory informed and affirming is that you understand that just because it's a certain way for you, right? It's because you can't feel it and experience it. You got to take a moment to understand how does this work? I think one other area of sensory need that's probably the most impactful yet is also the least understood is the eighth area, which is um, interoception. Yes. And that's because it ties so closely with our ability to 
regulate emotions. So interoception is basically how our brains sense and interpret internal bodily sensations. So if, for example, my heart is racing, do I even notice that? And if I do, how do I interpret that sensation as it, as it relates to where I am emotionally? Or another example that I think goes along with this is I've had clients who are neurodivergent who experience pain very differently. As a matter of fact, I had a, a client who fell and, and broke a bone and everyone just thought it was kind of sprained because he wasn't really complaining about it right. until it was several days later and it was really looking pretty bad. So that kind of goes along with that too. But I'm, I'm curious, can you talk a little bit about how that interoception really does intersect with emotional regulation um, and how we can kind of um, understand that and, and support that in, in kids? Yeah, it's absolutely um, probably the least understood. Mm -hmm. And part of that is because it, it was sort of the last produced sensory area. Yeah, it's the newest, quote unquote. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so it hasn't necessarily been around as long, but it's so interesting because it is all kind of internal. Mm -hmm. And I think what happens with emotion regulation or regulation in general, that doesn't necessarily have to be tied to an emotion. Sure. What happens is that it's just hard for kids to recognize what's happening. Mm -hmm. It's easy to kind of do experiments with this with people who have no sensory needs because you can go, okay, I want you just to kind of, what, what feeling are you feeling right now? Scan your body, yourself. Are you feeling kind of happy, a little melancholy? Are you excited? Do you feel peaceful? And, you know, most of them will come up with something and then ask, how do you know you're feeling that? Mm. And then they're kind of like, I just know. Yeah. I'll tell you how you know. It's your sensory system. Right. Now imagine if you couldn't feel anything. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what happens for a lot of kids who have issues with that particular sensory area. Like there just may not be anything that's really coming up there. And to keep coming at them with, how are you feeling? Uh, answer this, express it. These folks probably have good intentions. They're working off of how can you not because I can so easily. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard for them to understand what would be sort of the absence of that. And so then it becomes very hard for kids to answer those questions. Mm -hmm. They can't even answer them for themselves, let alone your question. They can't sit around on their own and you know, answer for themselves. What feeling do I have? Some neurodivergent kids, some autistic neurodivergent kids actually do better without the sort of traditional language attached to a particular emotion idea. Mm. They do better with recognizing different kinds of energy levels, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, as related to being able to connect to a feeling, if you will, or that certain states of body existence translate better as an emotion than the traditional, you know, I'm sad right now, or I'm mad, or I'm happy. Uh, and that's just one of the things we got to be aware of when we work with neurodivergent kids. It's always about trying to understand the neurotype and the system of the child in front of us. And that awareness that it could be very different from ours in some way. And that's even neurodivergent to neurodivergent. Right. That's not just neurotypical to neurodivergent. Yeah. And that leads to alexithymia, which I think is something, again, that is not very understood. But basically, I feel like those two things go are so closely related. And so alexithymia is the difficulty that some individuals have. And not necessarily, I mean, I think we see it a lot in autistic individuals, but it's not exclusively there. But the real difficulty or even inability to recognize and identify emotions. And to me, I don't know, it's anecdotal, I guess, but but with the clients that I've worked with a lot of times who really struggle with that quite often, they also seem to have a hyposensitivity to some of that interoceptive mm -hmm. awareness. And so if I can't recognize that when I'm upset or nervous that my stomach gets tight or that my cheeks flush and I don't have that same sort of sensory input into my brain, it makes it really difficult to recognize what that emotion is or label that emotion. 
And you mentioned how it's really helpful to sometimes focus on energy levels. I also try to, I think, go at it another way as well, which is to focus on the thoughts. Mm -hmm. What are the words that you're kind of thinking? Sometimes if they can at least verbalize that, which sometimes they can and sometimes they can't, but that can also help us really figure out like, what do they need? How can they advocate? What is it that's happening in that moment? Yeah, it's an important concept for us who work with kids with sensory differences because you're going to work with kids with interoceptive challenges and we're so programmed, you know, as mental health professionals with this, just the classic, how are you feeling mm-hmm. today and all kinds of versions of that, even in play therapy, right? Um, that we have to step back and go, okay, wait a minute, you know, this just might not be the avenue of processing for this child. And I can try one of these other things like we've been talking about here today. And that's kind of true for all the sensory areas as just a pragmatic comment here. Like, first of all, believe and understand this is real right. and this is happening to kids. And then second, you know, be willing to understand that this may be why something is happening. Yeah. So I need to change the way I'm thinking about what I'm seeing. It's not oppositional because they're not answering my question about a feeling, right? Or they're not trying because they keep having bedwetting issues. He won't eat and he's got to start eating. And I'm so sick of telling him to eat. Well, maybe he doesn't recognize when he's hungry. Right. Why is he flopping all over the place? You know, sit still. Why don't you sit still? Just to stop and go, hey, I know that this is real and exists. And so this could be what is happening here. And I need to be open to understanding that and exploring it instead of mislabeling Mm -hmm. what I'm seeing in front of me. Right. Are there any common beliefs about sensory processing sensitivities that you feel like should be dispelled? Any myths or just things that people misunderstand about it? Big myth number one is that it's not real. Yeah. That has gotten better, but I still run up against that every once in a while. Like it's not real. There's no support for it, uh, et cetera. And that's a big myth. Mm -hmm. Uh, Two someone can have sensory processing disorder, if you will, uh, or sensory differences as sort of a standalone issue. Uh, Absolutely, they can. It certainly can be a part and often is of other maybe diagnosis or other neurodivergence, but it certainly can present as its own individual type of neurodivergence. Yeah. I think another myth too is... Oh, everybody has sensory sensitivities. Mm -hmm. Uh, No, actually, some people don't. First of all, (laughs) they don't have any. Again, they just kind of take everything in and experience everything just very smoothly. And secondly, you know, just because every once in a while something bothered you doesn't mean you have sensory needs or sensory differences on the same level as someone who has SPD or really has sensory challenges with their system. I think the other one that comes to mind as you're just sharing those is also that through exposure, it'll go away. Right. Now, I do know that OTs, you know, and I'm not an OT, but but an occupational therapist, like there are some techniques that you can use to reduce some sensitivity to certain types of Of sensory input. Like, I I mean, I know that that's what they do. Right. But I think also the idea that if loud noises are really dysregulating, but if they're just in these loud environments quite frequently or something, then somehow they're going to, their brain is going to (laughs) not be as responsive or something. Right. That's just not how the brain works (laughs) with that sort of stuff. That is probably an important myth to share. Yeah. And let me go back a little bit. I firmly believe, I mean, this was certainly true for me, and I believe this is true across the board, it starts with awareness and empowerment of your system. Like, Mm -hmm. I know this now about me. This is how my system works. And that knowledge being presented in an affirming, empowering way, not a, you got this problem, you need to fix it way. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I understand me. I understand what's going on with me. I understand my system is key and that knowledge coming in an affirming way then 
I'm all for tips, tricks, techniques, interventions. I, I use some today, right? Nothing wrong with that. If you find something that helps you navigate a sensory situation, but the tips and techniques really come after the awareness and the affirmation of this is who I am. Yeah. Then they can be great. They can be, you know, very helpful. And just like you said, it doesn't just go away. I mean, it's never went away for me. If it was going to go away through some play therapy intervention, um, I wouldn't have it <laughs> because I've done a lot of those. Um, but I certainly have learned what I need to do to get through that ski lift, right? Yeah. And I certainly have learned how to advocate for myself. I certainly have learned how to appreciate my system and not judge it. And I've learned what some of my strengths are even within my sensory system. And those are certainly things that we can come in and help kids with in play therapy and mental health therapy who have these kinds of needs. Yeah. Well, I know um, we could talk all day, but this has been a really <laughs> yeah. great conversation. So as we wrap up our talk, I have, I have one last question. Okay. If you were working with a child or a teen who's beginning to just be aware of their own sensory differences, what would you want to be sure to tell them? Like, what's the, one of the first things that you would really want to help them understand? I think two things, you know, I, and they go together. Uh, I would really want to help them understand that it's totally okay to have sensory differences. And the second thing is I would make sure that we understood and discovered as much as we could what their sensory strengths are. Mm -hmm. The needs, we don't probably even have to spend that much time on discovering. Yeah. They're probably the front and center information that's coming in. So I really want to make sure those other two points are clearly getting in their thinking and awareness. Because there's probably going to be a lot that they have to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I just advocated for myself last week and had to move a whole podium around in a training I was facilitating because of how the sun was coming in through a window. Mm. So there's a lot, you know, that obviously we're going to have to do. So it needs to be in that atmosphere of it's okay that you have these differences. And don't forget, it's just not all about your needs. There are some strengths that come along with this as well. Dr. Robert Jason Grant, founder of Ought Play Therapy and author of Understanding Sensory Differences, a Neurodiversity Affirming Guidebook for Children and Teens. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank you. One of the things that we are beginning to realize about sensory processing differences is that they impact all aspects of our life. If we're experiencing sensory discomfort, we're more likely to be irritable or unable to focus. Depending on our level of awareness, we might be able to verbalize our needs, but many times we may not realize what's really bothering us. Younger people with sensory discomfort or needs that are going unmet might struggle because the environment that they're in, like school, for example, is rigid in how it allows or doesn't allow kids to meet those sensory needs. Rules about not wearing sunglasses inside or insistence on sitting still without fidgeting or blanket expectations to not use earbuds in any situation can remove options for young people to independently meet their needs. Recognizing and supporting sensory needs is a key component of the neurodiversity-affirming world that we, and our kids, deserve. I'm Emily Kircher-Morris. I'll see you next time on the Neurodiversity Podcast. Thank you to Robert Jason Grant. There's more information about Ought Play Therapy and his other work on our website. Thanks to the musicians who made the music for today's episode, Alex Lane, Stationary Sign, 
Jacob Album, and The Big Letdown. And don't forget, we have a place where you can join conversations about neurodiversity, share ideas, and maybe just bent a little. It's called the Neurodiversity Podcast Advocacy and Support Group. Find a link to it in the show notes. Our host is Emily Kircher Morris. Our social media coordinator and production assistant is Krista Brown. The executive producer and studio engineer is me, Dave Morris. For all of us here, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. This is a production of the Neurodiversity Alliance.